So exploring the images of chaotic dynamical systems by Jeremy, Andres, and I'm on. All right. So in dynamical systems, we study the iter we study iterative functions. So when we talk about iterative functions, we mean taking the output of one function and putting it back in. And it's very similar to um, pressing the equal button on your calculator. Um, and one thing to note is that we use the n this notation to denote the n um, iterate. So f of three would be f of f of f of x. And an example of um, an iterative function would be this. So we start at two, put it into x, and then put the output right back in. And we get an orbit, which is just the sequence of numbers that comes out of it. OK, so now that we've defined iterative functions, we can also um, realize that there are a few points on the iterative functions that tell us a lot about their behavior. Uh, these points are fixed points and periodic points. And so fixed points are just any points that when you plug it into the iterative function, you get the same point as an output. Um, so an example of this would be plugging one into the squaring function. Uh, you get one in return because one squared equals one. And something to note is that the orbit of these fixed points is just going to be the same point repeating forever. Um, periodic points are similar to fixed points, except that their orbits repeat in cycling values. So as an example here, we have a, fixed, or we have a periodic point of prime period 2. Here, uh, O of n, or 0, or the seed of 0 here. We have it cycling from 0 to negative 1 to 0 to negative 1. And so we call this uh, prime period two because it takes two values before it goes again. So in general, um, we have a few ways of finding these fixed points uh, because believe it or not, mathematicians don't always just know where important points are. Um, and so for fixed points, since we defined it where um, the output is gonna be equal to the input, we can think of this graphically where um, the iterative function crosses the line y equals x. And we can just solve for this um, using algebra or some other method. For periodic points, we take a similar approach, except instead of solving for where the function crosses the line y equals x, we solve for where the nth iterate of the function crosses the line y equals x. And this will end up giving us um, all the periodic points of prime period n, n minus 1, n minus 2, all the way down to 0. Um, and just something very quick to notice is that um, when we're solving for these periodic points for different prime periods n, we can't just solve for all of them at once. We have to solve for each prime period uh, individually or up to as many as we want. Like we can't just solve for all the periodic points up to infinity. Um, and yeah, so that we'll, we'll end up like reaching some limitations in just what computers can do in the real world. So we won't be able to find all of them. All right, so in general, there are three different kinds of fixed points. So we have attracting, repelling, and neutral. The main two would be attracting, repelling, and those are the ones we look at for the behavior of um, iterative functions that we iterate them. So fixed points and repelling points are kind of self-explanatory. Attracting points, they attract orbits. So here we can see we start at 0 0.5 x naught, and it attracts the point into 0, 0 and that's where your fixed point is, so that's an attracting fixed point. And for a repelling fixed point would be here, this is an example, we have a fixed point at 1, 1, and you can see we start x naught at 1.1, and it repels the orbit as it goes away. Right, and so now that we've seen that um, periodic points and fixed points tell us a lot about the behavior of the orbits of points in the functions, um, just intuitively, it's important, or like it'd be useful to know, or like have an idea of where these fixed points and periodic points are. And so, what mathematicians use is uh, bifurcation diagrams to get an idea of where they are. And so, generally, a bifurcation diagram is going to tell us where the periodic points and fixed points are for a whole family of functions. Um, and what I mean by a family of functions is just um, like the general structure of a function. So, up here we have um, a quadratic function which is going to have the form x squared plus c, some constant c. Um, and yeah, so when we graph the bifurcation diagram, we get an idea of every function that has that form. 
and it's in the locations of its fixed points and periodic points. So as we can see the pink and green graph here, on the, uh, on the x axis we have c values, um, and this is just gonna be the, the constant that we have in the equation x squared plus c. And then on the y, val on the y axis we have uh, x values that correspond to the locations of fixed and periodic points. So uh, I guess it can be a bit confusing to look at at first, so I'll try and help digest a point here. So up here we have um, the, the coordinate c equals negative one and x equals one. So this is just telling us that for the function x squared minus one, if c equals negative one, we have a fixed point or a periodic point at x equals one. Um, and yeah, so also you'll notice that there are two different colors. Uh, the green corresponds to attracting points and the pink corresponds to repelling points. And uh, interestingly, there are many, many more uh, pink points than green points because the criteria for an attracting point is much smaller in like, depth, I guess. Like, it's, it's much harder to be an attracting point than a repelling point, basically. So yeah, so this will be a very general trend for every family. All right, so uh, you've just seen a bifurcation diagram, and now this is what's called an orbit diagram. It looks pretty similar, but uh, what an orbit diagram is telling us is the eventual behavior of a function given some seed for different values of c. So in this particular example, we have the bifurcation, uh, the um, orbit diagram of x squared plus c, and uh, this seed is zero, and as you can see, Oh. Uh, at the start, for c values on this range, the eventual behavior after many iterations is pretty much just going to one to like singular points. And on this interval, it's going to two different points. On this, it's going to four. And in this gray area, it's kind of just hopping everywhere. And that's what chaos looks like. And well, the algorithm for a orbit diagram is, of course, you want to have your function, and you want to pick a initial value um, called a seed, and of course you want to pick the range of C values you want to graph. Then you want to step through all your C values, and it's better if the uh, step size is smaller. And then you want to iterate through with your seed uh, through f of x, fc of x, many, many times. Um, but you do want to ignore the first hundred or more terms, because those terms are not going to tell us much about the eventual behavior of the function. Um, but the, the terms afterwards, we want to record them because they are going to tell us something that we want. So then we would plot all the recorded values with the corresponding C values, and that's how you end up with something like this. All right, so we're going into the f function families. So. This is the quadratic family, x squared plus c. And over here on the left, we have an orbit diagram, and on the right is a bifurcation diagram. You can tell, you can see that they're quite similar um, in shape, especially like this green part, right? And that is because, um, again, the green are the attracting fixed points, so they attract orbits nearby. And for this part here and this part here, basically all the orbits seeds that you start with, all the when you iterate the seed, the function always ends up on these fixed points. And it goes along, same here, same here. And you can see where all these points come from and why it looks like how it does. Um, and for the next few slides, we'll be introducing some more function families. And we'll be taking the der derivative and antiderivative of these functions. Um, and generally, when we take um, derivatives of a function, the highest degree of the polynomial decreases. So generally, the behavior of the graph also simplifies. Um, and while we take antiderivatives, the degree of the polynomial increases. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean the behavior becomes more complicated, as we'll see in the next few graphs. Um, so here are the, the quadratic antiderivatives. So first we can see the behavior again, very similar to the regular um, 
quadratic family. And this is just a zoomed in version of the green part here. And this part, believe it or not, is just that tiny little green part over there, just zoomed in. And then this is the, this is like a very expanded view of the bifurcation diagram. But since most of these points are repelling, there isn't much interesting going on, just this green line here. All right, so this uh, is the bifurcation diagram for the logistic family, and this is the orbit diagram for the logistic family. And well, logistic families or, and their diagrams tend to be kind of like the hallmarks for chaotic images. Okay, and uh, on this slide, you see this image right here is actually just a part of this one. This zoomed out image shows that there is a much larger picture going on. There's much more going on than just what we graph. It also comes to show that there's only so much we can do. If we miss this much on our last diagram, there's probably a lot more we're missing due to the limitations of our computers. So this is the first derivative of the logistic family. And lo and behold, it's pretty boring. Uh, it's just a curve here, and that curve is corresponding to this little green line over here. And, you know, it makes you understand that not all functions are going to be chaotic. Some functions are going to simply exhibit very simple looking bifurcation diagrams or orbit diagrams. And this is the first and second antiderivative. And of course, like Jeremy said, when we take the antiderivative, we raise the highest degree. So we do get something chaotic, uh, like this right here. This is the first um, antiderivative and its bifurcation diagram. This is the orbit diagram for it. And when we get to the second antiderivative, it gets a little harder to see where the chaos is. You can see the little thing right here. <laughs> and uh, well, it's hard to see where it is on this bifurcation diagram. You usually want to look for the green, and that would show you where the um, orbit diagrams are. It's a bit hard to see. You really only see this green line. But, uh, well, they're not really mapped to the same range, but I think it's somewhere around here. And uh, when, we, when I first um, plotted this uh, orbit diagram, I originally got a straight line, and I wasn't sure why. But when we went through and we tried different seeds, for example, I believe the seed that generated this orbit diagram was a critical point of the second antiderivative of the logistic uh, family. So it comes to show that there is a very big importance and very big uh, emphasis on the initial conditions for these diagrams. Okay, and here we have the cubic family. And uh, you'll notice that this is a polynomial of degree three but um, the graphs seem to be very simple. So um, it kind of contradicts our idea that higher polynomial degree leads to more chaotic behavior. Um, and then here we just graphed uh, the, no, wait. <laughs> here we just graphed the uh, first and second antiderivatives of the cubic function. And um, basically the results are pretty similar to what we saw earlier. Except um, here on the second antiderivative, we saw something surprising. Um, the bifurcation diagram seems rather simple and straightforward with just three lines, but then we still see chaotic behavior in the orbit diagram. Uh, so earlier uh, we mentioned that when we're computing the periodic points and fixed points, we can't actually always solve the equations. Um, and also we can't look for periodic points of every prime period. So uh, we hypothesized that we missed some very high prime period, and that's causing the uh, chaotic behavior over here. Yep, and these are just the uh, sine functions. Um, again, the representation of the bifurcation diagram on the orbit diagram, see a lot of the attracting fixed points here, and then descending into chaos here. Um, and we can see here some limitations of our computers because there's so many points here that the computer just has to like compress everything and that's why it gets all kind of muddly here. And same with the following few slides. It's all 
basically just a big coloring book. And the antiderivatives and the derivatives are almost the exact same because it's just a change in sign because, um, you know, um, it just flips it. And yeah. Uh, we have a site. Check or, it out. Yeah, you can graph your own bifurcation diagrams yep. on this. Uh-huh. And yeah. And these are our citations. 